Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 9 as we come to the end of this chapter. We've been in this chapter for several weeks, and today in the passage we're going to look at starting in verse 35, you're going to see Jesus appear on the scene again. I don't know if you realize it or not, but for the last, since chapter, since verse 7, Jesus hadn't been in the story. Uh, Since he made the mud pack and put it on the blind man's eyes and told him to go wash at the pool. And the man came back, he was seen, but Jesus wasn't anywhere around. And, and so Jesus kind of withdrawn uh, to some degree at this point. And the Pharisees have uh, quizzed the blind man or the formerly blind man. They've quizzed his parents. They've come back and quizzed him again, literally interrogated him about who he was and, and, and what had happened and who this blind man was. Was he really the one that had been blind since birth, and so some of the neighbors said, well, he looks like him, but it may not be him, and others said, no, that's him, there's no doubt, and the man kept saying, I am the one, I'm him, I am he, that was blind and begging and always here, but all the attention is going around the Pharisees checking him out with the neighbors, with his parents, questioning him, and Jesus has not been in the scene. Now, the Pharisees have become so incensed that this man has declared that he believes that Jesus really is from God, that he probably really is a prophet. They become so incensed about it that we saw last week in verse 34 that they put him out. And, and that means out of the synagogue. They, they excommunicated him. They'd already determined, we found out, that anybody, if anyone should convet, confess Jesus to be the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. And so that happens to this man. They said, if you're going to say positive things about this man, Jesus, this teacher, if you're going to call him a prophet, if you're going to say that he is from God, which are all things that he said, then you're out of here. So in verse 35, we pick up with Jesus having heard of what has happened. He's heard that he's been put out of the out of the synagogue. So hear, hear the word of the Lord starting in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, Jesus said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now that imagery, the Son of Man, coming out of Daniel chapter 7, it's, it's, a, it's imagery out of Daniel about the Son of Man, the, the Messiah coming in judgment and coming to, to separate and come to coming to set the believer apart from the the unbeliever and all these things. So so he looks at him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Doesn't ask, do you believe that the Son of Man is coming? Do you you believe that that there is such thing as the Son of Man? But do you believe in, do you put your faith in the Son of Man? Verse 36, he answered, the man answered and said to Jesus, and who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Now, the word Lord there is probably more of a polite sir at that particular verse than it is the the declaration that you'll see a little later. He said, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. First place in the New Testament, we see anybody responding to Jesus in worship. We'll see that after the resurrection. We'll see that in post-resurrection appearances. But this is the first time, pre-resurrection, first time at any point, that any of the gospel writers say that anyone worshipped Jesus. Worship is something that is reserved only for God. Worship is something that is only for the great I am. And, of course, Jesus has been saying over and over, that's who I am, but they haven't heard him. But this man stood there before him and said, who is this son of man? And Jesus said, you've both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. Earlier on, he said, I've never laid eyes on this man, Jesus. I don't know who he is. Jesus says, now you have seen him. You're looking at me, and I'm talking to you. And he said, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Now, now this has been a little personal conversation between the blind, formerly blind man and Jesus at this point. 
But evidently it's in a, a fairly public place because now we find that even though Jesus had been talking to him directly, uh, the Pharisees are somewhere nearby and they can overhear the conversation. And so the Pharisees, those of the Pharisees, verse 40, those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see your sin remains. Your sin remains. It's an interesting encounter here. Jesus moves back on the scene. Jesus comes back after this man has been excommunicated from the synagogue. After he has seen the the worst thing that could happen to any Jewish person, especially a Jewish male, in that day, he is put out. He is is turned away from the only connection to God that he knows about, the only connection to spiritual life that he knows about, being there in the synagogue, being able to worship in the synagogue. And and here comes the Pharisees and say, if you're going to say this about him, if you're going to say positive things about him, then you're out of here. We'll have nothing to do with you, and you'll have nothing to do with the synagogue. And he's put out of it. Jesus hears about it, and he comes back to him, and he encounters him in this gentle, loving, careful way to show him that the one who spit in the ground, made the mud, massaged his eyes, and sent him off to to wash is now standing before him. You know, a lot of times we see these stories, and we, we don't realize what you're seeing. I want you to see here the anger of the Pharisees is growing. They've been angry throughout all of his ministry. They've been disturbed every time he's done a miracle and and given a discourse to support what that miracle was, feeding the 5,000, I'm the bread of life, turning water into wine and saying, I am the living water. I mean, every time the Pharisees have gotten a little more incensed, a little more troubled, a little more angry at Jesus. But I want you to see with this blind man, when a man who who was born blind, blind from birth, is given sight, they know very clearly that Isaiah said, that's the mark of the Messiah. That is the true sign of Messiah. Nobody else is going to come along and do that. The blind man even said, no one's ever done that, have they? No one's ever come to a man that's born blind and given him eyesight. And the implication is, and understanding is there, of course they haven't. Nobody can do that until the Messiah comes. But they are so antagonistic, they are so much against Christ because he doesn't fit their mold of what they think the Messiah ought to be that they just get angrier and angrier and angrier. And this is showing us that we're moving. John is moving us slowly but surely and meticulously and dramatically toward the cross. The ultimate anger toward him will be nailing him to that cross, thinking they're doing it to him, but knowing we know now on this side of the cross that he is going there voluntarily, he's going there at the Father's will, he's going there by the Father's command, but their anger is beginning to boil. And when they hear this man saying, oh, he's got to be a prophet, he's got to be somebody special, they put him out because they cannot stand the name of Jesus. They cannot stand the thought. Maybe he is the Messiah. As a matter of fact, when he talks there in the end of this passage, we just read about uh, those who are blind will see and those who, who see will become blind. I mean, I entitled this sermon, you know, the, the, the blind see and the, the seen are made blind. I mean, that's exactly what's taking place here. That's exactly what happens when Christ burst on the scene. You see, the Pharisees thought they could see. The Pharisees proclaimed, we have the light. We understand all about God because we've got all the rabbinical tradition on our side. We've got the law of Moses on our side. We have committed ourselves to that our entire lives. We are sighted people. And Jesus comes along and says, your own, religious, your own religiosity, your own desire to be seen as something big has blinded you. They don't accept that. They say, we're not blind, are we? Are you saying that we're blind? What do you mean those who see will be made blind spiritually? How how can you say such a thing? And Jesus is simply saying, understand this. This man was blind. Now he sees physically and spiritually. He's about to see the absolute totality of who Jesus is. This man knows 
Jesus has done something special. One thing we have in this passage, I want you to see, really there are four things here I want you to glean and understand out of this, and then we'll be done. The first thing is I want you to note that this man expresses the human condition prior to meeting Christ. We brought that out before, but I want you to note that today as we leave this chapter and move into his next discourse. I want you to see that this man, this man blind from birth, represents the condition of the whole human race prior to a person meeting Christ. They're blind from birth. They're blind spiritually from birth. They cannot see their need. They cannot see their sin. They cannot see who the Savior is. When when they are born in this world, they are born in sin. And and that is just part of the implication of being born into a fallen world. We have no natural spiritual perception. We talked about that Wednesday night over and over again. The Scripture talks about how to the natural man, the things of God are, are foolishness. To to the natural man, they can't see the truth of God. They are so blinded, they are so caught up in themselves, they are so self-centered that they cannot see who Christ is and can't even see their need for Him. This man sitting by the side of the road begging didn't see a need for Christ. He knew he had a problem, but he thought there was absolutely no solution for it. He'd been blind since birth. How could anything come along and help him? And yet Christ came along, sought him out, touched his face, gave him light. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, that human nature, human beings without Christ, their thinking became futile and, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that's how this man was. He was living in physical darkness that is exemplifying spiritual darkness. So the first thing I want you to see is this man exemplifies, expresses clearly the human condition prior to meeting Christ. Secondly, though, the man unbelievably models the way of salvation for us. It's amazing to see the progression that takes place. You know, a lot of times we think, boy, we're saved just in a moment, and and we are in, in one sense. But if you think back over your life, you will see that there was probably a progression that led you to that point of committing your life to Christ. Typically, it wasn't just, oh, I was walking in sin, walking in darkness, walking in hatred of God, and all of a sudden I said, whoa, what happened? Now I love God. Now I trust Christ. Now I turn around. Generally, there's a progressive nature, and this man shows us, first of all, I want you to see what he, how he talks about Jesus. All the way back in verse 11. When they said, okay, how did you see? How were your eyes open? He starts in verse 11 by saying, the man who is called Jesus. This is what he did. He put mud on my eyes, told me to go wash. I went away, I washed, and I received my sight. But here his his expression is just the man. There there was a man. He he was like you and me, I I suppose, but they, they call him Jesus. He's been going around and teaching and preaching and I've heard of miracles, we've heard of miracles he's done, but, but, but all he could conjure up to say about him was the man. Many times, that's how our, our walk of faith begins. We, we see there's something unique about the man. We see there's something unique about Jesus, and we, we start thinking about that uniqueness. But, but he moves on. In verse 17, you'll see as they continue to talk about him, continue to interrogate him, the, the Pharisees say, this man, again, Pharisees see him just as a man, is not from God because he does things on the Sabbath. And, and, and others were saying, how can this man who's a sinner perform such signs? And, and then in verse 17, they said, therefore, to the blind man, what can you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. He's more than just a man. He, he's, he's, got, he's got to be a prophet of some sort because he's doing things that no other man did. There's got to be some dimension. It's just like in Caesarea Philippi when Jesus looked at his disciples and said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're Elijah and some say you're John the Baptist and some say you're one of the other prophets. And they kept going on about people are seeing something special about you, but they put you in with all these other prophets. And Jesus turned and said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Simon Peter, stood up and said, why, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I have a feeling 
the most shocked person in that group was Simon Peter. Did I say that? Jesus said, you know, Peter, it wasn't flesh and blood that revealed that to you. In other words, it wasn't your own good sense. It was your heavenly Father. It was the Father in heaven. He has shown you that. He has given you sight. He has opened your eyes so that you can see. This man is to that point where the people were. He's a prophet. Good man, great man, good teacher. He's a prophet. Then in verse 30, he gets a little closer and as they're talking to him there. And, and they, they, they say to him, you know, what's, what's, what's really happened here? We know God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's from. And, Jesus said, and the man answered them and said, well, here's the amazing thing. That you don't know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. There's an implication there, again, back to Isaiah, that the Messiah would be the one to open the eyes. And so he, he says, well, he's a man called Jesus. He's a prophet, and I don't know where, you may not know where he's from, but he, there's some indication he's from somewhere special because he opened my eyes, and I was blind since birth. Then in verse 33, he makes a little more astounding statement. He says there, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He's the man they call Jesus. He's a prophet. He opened my eyes. Fourthly, he's from God. He's from God. If he weren't from God, he couldn't do these things. If he weren't from God, he could preach, he could sound pious, and he could be religious, but he opened my eyes. If he weren't from God, he could do nothing. Right on down to verse 38. And he said, Lord, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. The word worship there is a word that literally means to just fall prostrate before him. To fall down before him. Say, Lord, I believe, and fall as low as he can on the ground before him, expressing an unworthiness, expressing, a, a, expressing an absolute dependence, expressing an absolute submission to him. And that's where salvation comes. That's that final move of salvation. Faith is always a journey towards Jesus, right up to the commitment to him as Lord. And that's where salvation comes. That's where it begins. That's when sight has been given and new life has been born. And we know that's so in our lives as well as in the life of this man that was born blind. Physically, spiritually. The, the picture is just the same. And falling prostrate before him. Falling prostrate before him on the ground and, and crying out, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of Man. I believe that you are the one who came in judgment. I believe that you are the one who has come from God. You are unique. You are unlike anything or anybody else that's ever lived. It's where we all have to come. We all have to come there. It's not just enough to say, oh, he's a prophet. He's a good man. He's a good teacher. I, I like his teachings. We have to come to that point of saying, you are the Son of Man. You are the Son of God. You are the Lord. And, and not just you are him, but I worship you. I submit to you. I fall down before you in this faith journey. See, Scripture is always calling us, always calling us to submission to Him as Lord. There's nothing of easy believism that just says, oh, I'll, I'll say He's the Savior, He's my Savior. Now give me all I want. No, it's submitting to Him and His will. It's praying the Lord's Prayer. Lord, not my will, but your, be, your will be done. Your will as it's done in heaven be on earth. And, and not just on the earth in general, but on the earth in my life. I submit to you. 
express, this man expresses the human condition. This man shows us the, the, the way of salvation, if you will. He also illustrates the repercussions that come to those who believe in Jesus. <laughs> you know, we, we get this idea from a lot of modern evangelism that, hey, hey, come to Jesus. Everything will be made right. Come to Jesus, you'll be happy. Come to Jesus, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Come to Jesus, you get everything you want. I wonder what this man thought about, would think about that kind of preaching when he came to Jesus and they threw him out of the temple. And there's implication here that his parents didn't even want to uh, be identified with him because he was getting a little too radical. He was getting a little too religious. He was getting a little too caught up in this Jesus stuff. And so, so they didn't really want to identify with him either. There's, there's a, a, at least an implication here that they separated themselves from him. There are always repercussions when you take seriously the gospel of Jesus Christ. I told you some of my testimony. I remember the, the night that, that I came to Christ, really bowed before him as Lord, under Deanie Chimes at the University of Alabama on campus. Going back to my room and having my dearest friend since we were three years old say, well, I guess this ends one heck of a friendship. I wasn't ready for that. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I, don't, I want to be friends. We've been friends since we were three years old. We've been friends our whole life. What do you mean? Ends of friendship. He recognized that if I was going that path, he wasn't. Had no desire to. And you've heard story after story of people coming to faith in Christ after being away and coming back to their own home and seeing old friends and they saying, well, let's go do this. And he said, well, you know, I, I just want you to hear what's happened in my life. Greatest thing in the world has happened in my life. Oh, what, did you get, get engaged? Did you engaged? No, I didn't get engaged. I came to understand the Lordship Jesus Christ. Oh, it's really been good seeing you. Walking away. That's what happened in this man's life. Christ can, and I would even go as far as say, usually will cause some division. So, I mean, I thought Jesus just brought peace and unity and happiness and. I don't know where you got that. If you look at what one thing Matthew recorded back in Matthew chapter 11, these, these are words of Jesus. You don't have to turn there, just listen. Look at it later, Matthew 34 and following, Matthew 11, 34 and following. He, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. <laughs> I didn't come. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Maybe that's the explanation there. And a man's enemies, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. For he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus says, I want you to understand, Jesus says, I want you to understand something. There may very well be repercussions for taking the gospel seriously. You can go to church, no big deal. As long as what you hear in church and say you believe in church and sing about in church doesn't transfer to Monday through Saturday, it's okay. No, nothing like, you know, it's okay, to, it's okay to do that. The world will love you for that because that's really loving the world. That's really saying, you know, I, I got this cross that that Christ died on in my place that I need to pick up and carry, but I just want to hold it this one hour. Then I'll neatly lay it aside, and 
I'll go my very way and be myself and live for myself the rest of the week. I'll come back next week. I'll find that cross where I left it, and I'll hold on to it for one hour, and I'll sing about the great I am, and I'll sing about a debtor to mercy alone, and I'll, I'll sing about all those great things about the gospel, and then I'll get finished. I'll say, okay, that was nice, fun, very comfortable, not real, tough. I'll go out again. I've always been amused when I've gone off to conferences of various natures and they always have a speaker or a seminar or something that says how to make your church acceptable to the community. Always amazed at that. Now, we don't do anything to try to be unacceptable, understand that. We don't try to offend. But the cross is offensive. You tell a lost person, you've got you to die on the cross with Christ to be right with God. And, and they'll say right quick, hey, God likes me. I'm a good person. This man shows us that Christ can cause and many times will cause division. And then this man's story, fourthly and finally, expresses the division which is coming which the coming of Jesus produces. It's, it's beyond just father and mother and family and friends and all that. But he said, there's going to be a major division. Verse 39, he said, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not, do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Spiritually. Blind. Pharisees who claim to be the light of Judaism said, we're not blind, are we? Jesus said, yeah. Because those who respond to Christ respond by coming to the light. He dealt with that back in chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Some people look at this verse 29 and they say, wait, isn't this a contradiction? I mean, if you go back to that encounter with Nicodemus that we looked at months ago in chapter 3, Jesus said, after he said in John 3, 16, that great verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Isn't Jesus contradicting himself there? No. Go to the next verse in John chapter 3. He said, he who believes in him is not judged. But the one who does not believe, the one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, Jesus' coming is going to divide in that way. There's going to be those who believe and are walking in the light, have, have their blindness removed. There are going to be those who do not believe, who are already judged and under judgment because they will not see, they cannot see who he is. Jesus said, I want you to understand, there will be a division The light of Christ shines savingly and renewingly in the light of those to whom he touches and are given life. But those are judged who refuse to come to the light, who stubbornly cling to the light that they claim is already in them. I have enough light. I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. I've got enough light. Oh, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, I, don't believe, I don't even necessarily believe there's a personal God, but I've got this God light within me, you know. It just kind of wells up, and I, I'm going to tell good, and, good from bad and right from wrong. And she said that, that light is no light at all. That light is blindness. This man shows us as as he angers the Pharisees, as the religious leaders become more and more determined to put an end to Jesus, 
John is showing us the move toward Calvary. In chapter 10, he's going to give us his last discourse, his last teaching. And then in chapter 11, he's going to give us his final miracle, his seventh sign, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And once that happens, it is irrevocable. Once that happens, once they see, you know, they got angry over a man born blind being able to see. Wait till you see how angry they get when they see a man who's been dead for four days come back to life. <laughs> oh, John tells us, I'm going to get ahead of myself here, but you need to know this. John tells us that they immediately set out to put Lazarus back to death. They said, we got to get him back in that grave. He became a dangerous man. This blind man, formerly blind man, is a dangerous man to man's way of thinking. He's a dangerous man to man's pride. And so we can't have him in the synagogue. We can't have him around our people. They'll, he'll just start talking about Jesus. And no longer does he say the man they call Jesus. Now he calls him Lord. Now he worships him. We can't have him around. He's a dangerous man for the gospel. Let me ask you this question and I'll close. And only you can answer this. And I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I just want you to think about it. How dangerous are you for the gospel? How dangerous are you to the false religions that our world is inundated with? How dangerous are you? Let me tell you, there's a way to test it. Do they want to shut you up? Let's pray. Father, I humbly bow in your presence. And first of all, Lord, I ask you to make me dangerous to the establishment of false religions. It's danger, dangerous for the gospel. And I ask you, Lord, to make all of us who know you dangerous where we work and where we play, where we live. Dangerous for the gospel. May the demons hate us, and fight against us. And all those they control. Because they can't stand the gospel. They can't stand the light. They hate the light. Because the light exposes their sin. So they want to put it out. We know that, Lord, you are the light. We just merely reflect it. But we are to be your light reflected through us. And that will make us dangerous. Thank you, Father. 
Father, I pray for men and women here that may not know you this morning. Lord, touch their hearts, open their eyes, that they might see their sin and, 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 and might see you as their Savior and call out to you for mercy and grace. Father, I pray for others who are just kind of playing religious games. Lord, bring us to a point where we fall prostrate before you. and Acknowledge you as the great I am. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.